Hi, everybody. This is your old pal, Uncle Hondo, your Las Vegas Raiders beat writer on Sports Illustrated and the host of the Las Vegas Raiders Insider Podcast. It's great to be with you all. I don't know where you're at. It is very early in the morning, but welcome to me. Good to see you all here in Kauai. And uh, here in Hawaii, it's bye week. Yeah, I'm in Hawaii, but we're still working. And uh, going to get to some mail today. I want to address a couple of things, though. I appreciate all of you. Got a lot of email over the last couple of days, and I want you to know that it's appreciated, and I'm thankful for it. All right, let's get right to some email I want to read. The first one comes though from Doug H. Doug H., and here's what Doug asks. He says, hey, Hondo, I uh, hope you're having a great vacation. Uh, I, do, I appreciated the deep dive article. It brought a lot of things into light. With all the changes, do you feel like the team feels rejuvenated? Uh, great question, Doug, and I'm going to be very blunt. I don't, I don't have a, a feeling on this at all. First of all, it's the bye week, so the guys aren't around. Second of all, I'm in Hawaii, so I'm, I am working, but I'm not talking and communicating as much, so it would be unfair. I will tell you, though, what, I, what is my opinion, and I believe that you know I don't just give opinions wantonly, so I try to take an opinion that's based on experience um, and based on the facts that I do have. I think this team is very frustrated, and they're, and one of the things that I've told you, and it, it wasn't platitudes, one of the things that they have done is they have made this about themselves. They're angry at themselves at where they are. This is not a team of finger pointers. There's no finger pointers left on this team. There's nobody on this team who's running around saying, you know, you did this or you did that and, and you did this. Sorry, I know you can hear the ocean in the background. We got people talking. I apologize. But um, it is, you know, that's not this nature. So I don't know if rejuvenated is the word that I would use. And because I'm, you know, it's the bye week. They're not in the building. I'm not going to bother a bunch of guys on their off time. Any interaction I've had has been purely on a personal basis and not on a Raider basis. But I will just say this to you. I, I, I think anything that they that AP thinks is going to help this team, they buy into. So I don't know if I would say rejuvenated based upon the reasons that I've already given you. But what I would say is that in, they are a team that's hungry. They are a team that is unhappy with how the season's gone, just like you are. They're a team that I think there's some embarrassment that they feel because they they believe it was a much better team um, than what it's demonstrated, and they know the record in the NFL is all that matters. So I I don't like I said don't know that I would use the word rejuvenated, but what I, I don't know if you guys can hear all the roosters in Kauai, there are literally chickens everywhere, but I don't know that I would use that word rejuvenated, but I would say to you for sure. I think anything that they feel like is going to help them get it on track, they are buyers on. All right, let's get to the next one real quick. This comes to us from Jason Beaver, and Jason lives in Portland, Oregon. He says, Hondo, was Scott Turner moving uh, into the interim OC, Philbin to the O-line, and Norv Turner as an advisor? He just wants to know, uh, what, what do I think? What do I think about how it's going to affect the quarterbacks? First of all, Jason, thank you for emailing. I appreciate that very much. Um, this is what I would tell you. I think, first of all, Norv Turner, you know what he did with Troy Aikman. And everyone says, well, that was a long time ago. Yep, it was. Although that makes me feel really old to say that. But yes, but Norv Turner is tremendous in his work with quarterbacks. Scott Turner has been tremendous with his work at quarterback. And Joe Philbin has worked tremendously with quarterbacks. Aaron Rodgers is just one example. There is a tremendous amount of experience, quality, proven quarterback coaching in that, in that uh, room now. I think that's a very big deal. Um, I was asked last year um, about Getsy, was there anything that I thought was concerning? And I said, I don't know that I would use the word concerning, but I, I, I want I want I want when the Raiders were going to at that point, the talk was going with Aiden O'Connell. You want somebody with a young quarterback who's got a ton of experience. Um, but you've got Desmond, you've got Gardner and you've got 
Aiden, who are all three really tremendous young men, high character guys, and they know what these guys have done in the NFL. And so I think that this automatically helps that get better. No, I am not. I have never seen a mid-season shift better than what I saw last year after the firing of Josh McDaniels and what the Raiders did. And they did that with an inexperienced OC who had played quarterback in, in, in Hardigree, who did a really tremendous job considering everything that was against him. Tremendous job. So if they do, you know, what they did last year, I think that's a, a you know, a, a very sincere upgrade. Very sincere upgrade. Um, next one comes up from Paul Tyler. Paul lives in Toronto, Canada. And he says, um, uh, Hondo, after reading the deep dive article, I'm just curious if you feel like the previous incident has set the franchise back and by how much. In particular, the idea that maybe the Raiders uh, we're more focused on keeping Adams happy than what was going on. I don't think that was the case at all. I do not in any way, and I want to make this clear, think that the Raiders' goal was, ooh, let's keep Adams happy. It was all about winning. They saw Adams as part of it, and I think part of the problem um, was that there was a belief among many, not all, but among many in leadership that he wanted to be there. So, hey, let's keep him happy. I think had they understood like some of the team did that he didn't want to be there um uh, but no i don't i don't i do i think it hurt them yes yes i mean had had it not leaked they could have probably gotten more number one number two if some people had been in my opinion more, uh, a little more forthright he could have been gone a year ago um could have been gone certainly this off season. Um, so do I think it hurt him that way? Sure. I think it did. But I also think that it was nothing that set them back. I mean, this isn't, uh, oh my gosh, they're set back two years. Not at all. Not in the least bit. And so um, I just think it's a saga that's, that's good to be behind them. And again, I want to, I, I want to, well, I'm going to get to that in the next email. So thank you so much. Next one, next one email comes to us from Curtis L. And Curtis L. lives in Bangor, Maine. Curtis says, Hondo, I am the biggest Raider fan in the world. Stuck up here as far away from them as you can get in Bangor, Maine. I have a question. I thought the most telling part of your article was when you were, were told, essentially, that guys were going to remember things when they voted for captain. That struck me as a big deal. Could you explain how important are captainships in the NFL? They're mammoth. They're absolutely mammoth. Um, I, you may remember me telling you before, I had a coach tell me one time, he said, coaches will lie, players will lie, but the locker room will never lie. The locker room will always tell you what's going on. And that is a mammoth deal. There are things, um, and I don't want to reveal all of them because – just in case some of my competitors don't monitor those things that I have learned over the years to monitor very closely. Captainships is another one. Now, some coaches diffuse that and they'll say, all right, these are all the guys who are captains. And sometimes they'll have eight guys and you can tell there's people that they've added. So then it, it's not that big a deal anymore. But the real vote count is enormous. Enormous. And uh, that integrity in the voting process for captain is a big deal. Some coaches, again, try to diffuse it. Um, I know a coach one time whose quarterback did not make captainship, and he just gave it to him. And it really angered everybody because everybody knew they didn't vote for him. Everybody knew they didn't vote for him. Um, I will tell you this. There – I want to word this right. I, I I know for a fact multiple players. Uh, well, never mind. It doesn't matter. It, it does. I, I don't need to go down that road right now. But anyway, so I will just tell you that yeah, that is a very very big deal, and uh, it is a massive deal. And I watch that closely every year. But you have to watch it with the caveat of who. Uh, how did it work? Did the coach add anybody? 
that type of stuff. So what I usually try doing is early, early in the process, I start talking to players about, you know, who do you think is a potential, um, who do you think is a potential uh, captain? In your thought process, who do you think fits captainship? So I try to always have a, a, a strong idea before we get there. And, um, but again, can, you, you cannot overestimate how big captainships are. Thank you for that one. I appreciate that one. Let me get to the next one real quick, if you don't mind. This one comes from James. And James lives in Fresno. Um, says, uh, thank you for the deep dive. It connected a lot of the, of the dots. I intuitively knew, but didn't want to believe. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I want to make this clear. And I, I don't have to, but I, I think it's, I, I like Devante. He is an absolutely devoted father and husband, and I admire him for that. I don't think it was a good fit at all with the Raiders, at all. At all. And, but, I you know, football is separate than, than being a person. You know, and I just want to say you, you want what are you in the locker room? You want guys that are called glue guys. You want guys that, that the locker room is, is sacred to them. It's important to them. That's why I'll give you an example. Um, I knew a situation one time where the outside of the locker room, but in an in a building, in a, in a football building, I'm not saying it was Raiders or who, whatever team I've covered. I'm just giving you an example. There was a message that they wanted sent out, but that message didn't resonate with the locker room. And there became real anger towards people in the building, but who were not in the locker room, meaning players. <laughs> and I watched that dynamic. Now, that is not the case with this team right now. I'm not saying that it is, but it was just in a team I've covered previously. Um, that locker room will always tell you the facts. And sometimes, remember what I've told you, it's not just what they tell you, it's what they don't tell you. All right, let's get to the next one. Uh, this comes to us from Miguel. And you guys may remember because he's written us before. He is from Mexico. He is from Zacatecas, Zacatecas Mexico. He says... Uh, with the recent coaching changes in our offense, I have a question for you since um, I just have a question for you. I have heard that top notch offensive coordinators don't like to work with first time head coaches due to job security concerns and because they want to make a name for themselves um, to eventually land a head coaching job. He just wants to know if that's accurate. Well, I'll tell you a couple things there. Number one, um, I don't, I think that is too broad. You're painting with too broad of a, of a brush. Um, it depends on the guy. Antonio Pierce is highly respected. Okay. And so getting guys is not going to, would not be an issue for him. Just not going to be. The second thing, and I think this is a very big deal, is you make up a good point about wanting job security so they can go get a, a job. That is a very big deal. That is a very, very big deal. But it's a two-sided coin. If a very experienced offensive coordinator says to a new, a new head coach, hey, are you going to let me run the offense? Am, am I going to basically be the head coach of the offense? Yeah, I know you're the head coach, and you'll say when we're going for it on fourth down or whatever. But is it going to be mine? So I could put a stamp on it. I'll give you an example. Eric Bieniemy was really respected, and a lot of people thought, you know, man, this guy should be a head coach. He should be a head coach. But it greatly hurt him. He was an offensive coordinator with Andy Reid. And so people naturally, because there is no mistake, Andy Reid absolutely was the offensive coordinator in Kansas City, whether he had the title or not. 
So that's why he said, hey, I got to get out of here and go somewhere else because it's hurting me from getting a job. Sometimes that's the case, too. So I think you have to think about it. It's like Mick Lombardi when he was here with um, Josh McDaniels. Mick had the title. He certainly did a lot of offensive coordinator work. But I said at the time, there is no mistake. Josh McDaniels was the offensive coordinator. Exact same thing. So sometimes it works in their benefit. Sometimes it's a very, very big benefit for them, and it should be, and, and it should be. So there you go. Uh, next email that I thought was pretty funny for a lot of different reasons, and I, I think you'll agree with it. Hondo, I'm a long-time, Hondo, I'm a long-time Raider fan. I love your coverage of my Raiders, but I also hate it. I just wish the Raiders could have a drama-free year, one year. I am 61 years old, and even in the years that they've won, there's always been a lot of drama. It just seems like things can never go easy for the Raiders. Why are we this way? Well, that's a great question. Oh, and I'm sorry. And i got to get the guy's name. Uh, his name is Jack Q. Um, so, Jack that's a great question, but I, I want to say something to you. Every team has drama. And and I don't I, I, I don't even like the word drama, but I understand what you mean by it. Every team has guys that don't work out. You have to fire or cut or go get a new guy. Uh, that's just part of life. Let me put it to you. This. You have 70 players. Okay, you have coaching staff, you have employees, security, everything. So let's say that there's 250 employees in an organization, okay? I don't care who you are. You go anywhere in America and randomly select 250 people, <coughs> and you're going to have drama, or which are just people issues. But let's go back. Let's just take the locker room, 70 people. You go take 70 high testosterone fueled individuals all making substantial income in their lives successful in their lives and to get here they're six that's why i always laugh when someone says cut this guy he's trash well no he's not trash he's getting paid a lot of money to play a sport he may not be better than others but don't be ridiculous you know you're gonna the majority of the guys are awesome guys they're tremendous fathers. Um, they're great husbands or boyfriends. They're great children, great sons. The, the vast majority are tremendously good people. So occasionally one gets in trouble or you have some drama. Okay, th but, but tell me where you're going to get either 70 highly successful people or 250 reasonably successful people anywhere in america just randomly selecting 250 all different religions or lack thereof all different colors and so it's not you know you can't pin it on one thing it's just people and so i, I think sometimes because the raiders have so much that when you're in it you think it's more than what it is and then you look at other teams and say well they don't have any drama oh yeah they do they all do uh, many are, are not aware, but, you know, I'm a senior NFL writer now. And and so I'm keeping my eyes on all over the NFL. And I can tell you, drama is in every team. It's just like family. Every family has some semblance of drama. Every family has some of it. It's just the way life is. It's called life. And so I, I appreciate your wanting peace. Why? man that looks for a way to make peace I, I respect that immensely but i also think you need to understand sometimes you need to give your raiders a little bit more grace so there you go i want to get to the last one because i thought it was really excellent um and it came from frank b frank b frank b says this uh let me read it to you real quick hondo I am learning to appreciate something, and I wanted to comment to you about it and ask a question. When you first started covering the Raiders, you certainly were not harsh to Mark Davis. 
but you pointed out things that you were critical of. It appears to me over the last year, since the firing of Josh McDaniels, that that's changed with you. I really appreciate it, and it's given me a newfound respect for him. I can see now what you're saying about him growing as an owner, and I think you're 100% right. Here's his question. What will it take for others to begin giving Mark Davis more respect? Okay, Frank, great question. Great question. Um, I think you're 100% right. I was, I was critical of Mark where I thought it was very fair because I always want to be fair. But his maturation, it's been more than a year. Um, it started when he hired Josh. And I'm going to tell you why. And I know, I know we all can look back with the, with the advantage of 2020 vision. And we can see uh, the Josh McDaniels conundrum that the Raiders went through. But you have to remember, Rich Bisacci was extremely popular. People, A lot of people wanted him to keep Rich Bisacci. And he went and talked to a lot of people. He went and talked to a ton of people around the NFL. And he learned how highly sought after Josh McDaniels was. And But Josh didn't have to meet, leave New England. He was next in line in New England. Mark knew what he doesn't know. And so he went, gave Josh a ton of authority and a lot of money and went against the curve because he thought it would make his team a winner. It didn't work. But in that process is when I really, in talking to a lot of NFL people, there were a ton of NFL people stunned that he got Josh McDaniels. Josh could have just, I, I said at the time, now looking back, I realize it's laughable, but at the time there were probably 26 NFL teams and not all of them needed a coach who would have fired their coach to get Josh. He was a very highly sought after candidate. And Mark was the one who was able to get it done. He showed me a ton. Then after telling them that they were going to get the rest of the year, he just pulled the trigger after the Detroit game. Just pulled the trigger. And, I mean, that cost him tens of millions of dollars. He didn't care. He didn't like the fact that it looked, looked like his team wasn't having fun. He wants the Raiders to have fun. Uh, he wants them to win. And so, he, yet again, he was able to eat tens of millions of dollars because he felt it was right for his team. And then the hiring of AP, he knew that he had made a mistake. Uh, that's not the right, that's the wrong term. He knew that many felt he had made a mistake not hiring Rich Passaccia. He really wanted to listen to his team, and he hired AP. And, and again, that's sign of someone saying, I'm trying to improve. I'm trying to improve things. Now, I've heard a lot of people say, I mean, do you think – AP, is it is it a shoe in that AP's gone? No, I don't think Mark Davis wants to get rid of AP. Does that mean that AP is safe for next year? No, I don't believe that. I don't think he should be fired, but I, I'm, I'm not sure that it's safe there because going into the Detroit game, Josh and Dave Ziegler were safe. I think it's going to be something that's going to go, literally go through, and I think Mark's going to listen to Tom Brady a lot, which I'm not saying that's wrong. But I could tell you this, if you think Mark Davis is sitting in his office today going, hmm, I can't wait to fire Antonio Pierce, you're crazy. Because that's not truthful. And it's not reality. So there you go. I do have a ton of respect for him. I think he has greatly grown as an owner. I mean, he already was a proven tremendous business mind, far superior to his father business-wise. And he is in a quest to surround himself with the best football people. Now, I want to end with this question, Frank. You asked me, what will it take for him to get the respect that you feel like he's earned from me and now from you? There's one way, and I believe if you were to ask Mark Davis, this is his answer. I'm not claiming that this is a quote from Mark Davis. I'm just telling you, I, I would bet almost everything I have that if you asked him, what's it going to take for you to get the respect you deserve, this would be his answer. Win. Win. Winning covers a multitude of sins. And 
winning, you get away with a lot. And you earn a lot when you win. That's it. You just got to win. Just win, baby. And and I think that he'll get it. And you know what? If I was a betting man, and I don't bet on football because I cover it, I don't think that would be integrous. But if I were a betting man, I would bet that Mark Davis has better shots of winning than just continuing to perpetually lose. And I'll get into more of that in the offseason. Uh, just some things going on behind the scenes that I think he's doing to set the Raiders up for winning. And I think he's doing a lot right. I, I, as you know, I'm I, I'm not a Raider fan, uh, but I am a guy that's certainly rooting for Mark Davis to do well. I think the fans deserve it. I think the organization deserves it. And I think Mark's humility and the way that he's approaching this team, uh, the way it's group changing is tremendous. I have I have a lot of, I've always respected him because he's an NFL owner and he's earned that. But I respect Mark Davis, the man now, and he's earned that from me. I don't give that lightly. And so I, I think when you have somebody, I've shared this with you before. I learned in my life a principle. You want to surround yourself with fat people, faithful, available, and teachable. And when you have people who are faithful, and you have people who are available, meaning they're engaged, and you have people that are teachable, you can work with those people in every area of life. When I hire people to work for us at SI, and I do a lot of hiring now, um, the first thing I want to look at is faithful, available, and teachable. I had somebody sent me an email the other day that wanted to go, I need, you, I need you to tell me what I got to do to get in the building. I thought, What? We hired a young man a year ago named Michael Canello. Many of you know him because he writes for us now all the time. Graduated with his journalism degree from Fresno State. And uh, I just think the world of Michael. I just, I genuinely really think the world of him. And I remember saying uh, when Michael first emailed me looking for a job, you know, he had his degree. I mean, SI is the largest sports media company in the world. And it takes a long time to work to get here to, to do what we do. You just don't get those opportunities. And, and he wrote about and sent me this great email. But in the email, you just exuded faithful, available, and teachable. So he interned with our company, did so well. Now he's an employee. And, you know, he's not a beat writer. He's not a building or anything, but he's working towards that. But his attitude was phenomenal. And it opened doors for him. Mark Davis is genuinely respected around the National Football League. Now, I will tell you, because I've been told this by NFL people and ownership at other places, when he first got in the league, it was almost like, okay, I, I want to prove I'm not my dad. I want to get along with everybody. But now he has earned it because he has a seat at the table. He voices what he feels and thinks. He's and very intelligent. He thinks things through. He's principled. And so those things matter. I'm going to get into a lot of that this offseason. This offseason, we're going to have a really good deep dive article for you on, on the maturation of Mark Davis. And I think it's, you're going to love it. I think you're going to love it to, to see what are some things behind the scenes that I see. And, and that I'm being told and are happening. And I'm really looking forward to doing that. But that'll come in the off season. So, all right, everybody from uh, Kauai, Hawaii. It is good to be with you today. Still here, still working, just the family's vacation. But they're going to hit a luau tonight. But thank you all for being with us. I greatly appreciate you. I appreciate the fact that you read, you email, you watch, all of that. We're not entitled to that. I get up every single day and I got to work to earn you guys' trust. I got to work to earn the right for you to click and to watch a video or to read an article. And we don't take that for granted. And you guys are incredibly important and special. And so I appreciate all of you. So God bless you guys. Have a wonderful day. And uh, I'll see you soon. And again, from Hawaii, aloha.